of numbers work, that's great, like all real numbers or something like that. If not, we just make a list of all the numbers. So the domain is just like that. Uh, it's the set uh, negative 7, 2, 1, and negative 3. So then the range would be, Michael? I made a chart on mine. Um, well, that could work depending on how you did, how did you do that. Well, I made a chart, and then like at the top, uh -huh. I just wrote D on one uh -huh. side and then R on the other side, uh -huh. and then put all the numbers on them. That should work. As long as you, yeah, you're specifying, you're, you're breaking apart, and you're saying just this group of numbers is the domain, this group of numbers is the range. So then the range is the group of, of, of what? Output. Uh, the output. So all the outputs are 4, negative 5, negative 2, and 6 in no particular order. Uh, the domain and the range. Okay. So, which of these is a function? Both of them. Both. They're both functions. Okay. So this one's pretty straightforward, clear cut. It's a function. This guy goes to this guy. All right. But maybe you got tripped up and thought that wasn't a function. Why might you think that wasn't a function, even though it is a function, Michael? Uh, because like one output has two inputs. Uh. Yes, one input shares uh, two inputs, or, or two inputs share an output. Um, but that's not the rule. What is the rule about being a function, very specifically? One input has one output. An input can't have more than one output, or more specifically, an input has exactly one output, meaning it also can't have zero outputs. So it can have zero, and it can't have more than one, it has exactly one. Um, how about this? Is this a function? No. Why not? Negative one. Negative, negative one, one has negative two outputs. Negative one to negative one, negative one to negative five. Two different outputs for one input. Okay, so this one's good, this one's good, this one is not a function. Okay. We're going to get into this more. This is what's called a linear function. We're going to talk about how to graph lines. Um, it's going to become an easy process. But to start with, if we had no idea what this function looked like as a graph, uh, how would we get some idea, get started? Where could we start with a, a mystery function and, uh, and drawing its graph? Yeah. Start putting in numbers for x, like Zero, one, negative one, two, Put in negative numbers two. for x, yes. Put in numbers for x. So you said zero, one, one negative two, negative, yeah, just anything. Anything will do. The only thing that you couldn't put in for x would be, if we we're going to be technically speaking, things that are outside of the domain of the function, which means if you put the, a certain number in there, maybe you're dividing by zero, or you're getting the square root of a negative, or you're taking the logarithm of a negative number, or any number of things that, that are Mathematically undefined. It doesn't make any sense mathematically. So we just put in x's, and we find out what the y's are, and then we come over to the graph and we start putting what on the graph? Points. points. Put some points down, and then we'll see if we can make out some kind of a shape, some kind of a pattern that this thing might be following. Okay. So let's figure out what these y's are. If we put in 0, we'll get out. What? Negative one. Negative one? You do the math. I never do the math. Okay, if we put in a one, what will we get out? Zero. Put in a one, we get out zero. And a one there. And one times negative three fourths. Negative one and three fourths. 
negative one and three fourths. Good. You see, I've already been through this class. I don't need the exercise. I know what it is. So I'm going to ask you to do it. Uh, we put a negative two. Two. Three. We put in a two. This will be six fourths. Positive or negative three halves? Positive. Positive three halves. So negative one plus three halves. That's all the help I need. One half. One half. Negative one plus three halves. How many halves is one? Two. Two halves. Negative two halves plus three halves. Now well, that comes up to it. a positive region and a positive one half. Alright, so now we need uh, some kind of a scale to go off of. So we'll put little marks here. And it'll work. Okay, so it's zero, negative one. Now let me these different colors so we can see them. Zero, negative one. Uh, one and negative one and three fourths. Okay, and that's something like right there. Uh, negative two and positive one half. Something like that. Uh, what if we had to plot? This is really, really, really important right here. Okay, and it's you, sometimes you don't have the advantage of knowing what parts of your life are significant. This is a significant part of your life right now as I ask this question. If we were to keep putting numbers in for x, and figuring what comes out for y, and plotting those results, those solutions, right? Let's let's just kind of mull over that word solution for a second. If I put this x and this y into this equation, what will happen? You don't have to get specific, like what numbers you'll get, but what will happen? What will you see on both sides of the equation? Same number. The same number. Okay, what that number is, we don't need to be too specific, but we will get the same number. Okay, this is what makes something a solution. Zero, negative one, that ordered pair, is a solution to this equation. Because if I put zero in for x and negative one for y, the equation will be true. I don't get zero equals five. I'll get most likely negative one, since there's on that side is negative one. If we just mess around with this side, we get negative one equals negative one. That's how we found it in the first place, is we put zero in there and figured out what came out for y. Okay? So these are all, each one of these are solutions, okay? which we translate to ordered pairs. Then we take those ordered pairs and we translate them to points on a graph. Okay? So again, coming back to the significant point. If we keep finding solutions, just tons and tons and tons of solutions, and let's stay within, like, say, negative, uh, what is that, negative six to positive six. Let's, like, stay within those x values. What will we start to see in terms of the shape of this graph? Specifically the shape of this graph, what shape do you think it would take? A straight line. Okay? So the line that I'm about to draw through these points is not really just a line. You see what I'm saying? It's not just a point and another point and then a magical line that goes through those two points. On that line are also a bunch of points. Right? And I could have found any of those points if I picked the correct x value. As I draw this, okay, here, this line, well, I drew a line, but really what I did was it was a shortcut. I saved myself lots of time, the time it would take to draw all of these points. Okay? The important thing I'm trying to get you to see is that this line, in essence, is really made up of a bunch of points, an infinite number of points, just all along here. I can put dots, points, all along this line. Okay? And all those dots mushed together would make this line. So what this line is, is a bunch of points. And those points represent, okay, if this is kind of a, a difficult, we, we're trying to take all this information and, and synthesize it and understand it and spit it back at you. But if I take a point off this line, what's the significance of that point? That's a solution. If I, if I look at that point and I take its coordinates, x and y, 
gets a solution to this equation. This point, whatever it is, negative three, negative four, something, or that's for negative five, negative five comma something, negative five for x, something for y. If we had those, that, those exact values of that point, we could plug them in here, it's a solution. So all these graphs are, they're not magical shapes that are magically associated with these equations. And uh, I'm not making fun of you or anything if you think that, because that's what I thought when I was in school, in high school at least. I just thought, oh, we got a graph again. Now I gotta remember what the graph is supposed to look like, what shape it has. I have to remember all these things about it, where this thing's located, where that thing's located, all these different. It's not so much about that. It's about this shape is on it, right? On that shape, on that line. Why we want it, why we want to draw it is because it's the solutions, all the solutions to this equation. At least in here, it's all the solutions between these two x values. But if we keep it going, it'll keep being solutions to that equation. Okay. So that's what a graph is. So I told you last time, if you want to do yourself a favor, remember input and output. I'm going to talk about input and output all the time. Input, output, input, output. I won't let it die. Okay. Um, and what a graph is, there seems to be a difficult thing to grasp for most students. A graph is just a, a picture representation of those solutions, okay? of that input versus output. This input gives me this output, and I represent it graphically, I put a point there. And if I were to plot lots and lots of points, I would get some shape for certain kinds of equations. For this kind of an equation, I'll get a line. For other kinds of equations, we'll get something called a parabola. For other ones, uh, for non-functions, we might get circles or ellipses, uh, that kind of thing. So um, that's what a graph is in terms of input and output. Uh, like I said, we'll learn more about the shortcuts to graphing lines because I, all these equations for lines have certain things in common and we'll exploit those to graph these lines more quickly. Um, but we won't lose sight of the fact that these lines are just a bunch of points and all those points are just solutions to that equation. All right, so any questions about any of these problems specifically, or anything from the homework? Either the word problem that you didn't quite get, or graph you couldn't quite understand, or something? Was function notation or is function notation okay? Um, I was just confused on most of it. Just on that, that problem there? Okay, the other ones are okay. Okay, maybe not so much. Okay, so then if we talk about function notation, more than a couple people would appreciate a review of function notation. Sure. Okay, so um, a function, like we've said before, is just a thing that has input and output. We represent that mostly or at least up until now, we've represented it as y on one side equals something with x in it. Okay, so we could represent number 39 like this. y equals 7 minus 2 thirds x. Okay, works just like that. The thing about a function is uh, it's not like equations we saw like early in algebra. Early in algebra, we saw equations, and we solved those equations. And we, we solved for x. We got an equation with just x in it, and we figured out what x had to be. The thing about a function is x doesn't have to be any one thing. X could change, and all that would happen is y would change right along with it, according to whatever happens to x. We just multiply it by negative 2 thirds and add 7, and then you get what y is. So there's, oh, there's an infinite number of solutions now to this equation, and that's what we start to call a function. Um, so, what we're interested in, though, in, in, for all equations, are the solutions. What are the solutions to this equation? Um, and so we are starting out, just baby steps here in number 39. One of the first things we do to figure out a solution or two is to plug in a number for x. Just some number that who knows why it got picked, okay? 
So that's really all we want to do in this uh, in this problem is plug a number in for x, and then we'll get a grasp for a function notation and why we might use it instead of uh, doing it this way. So anybody looking at number 39, what number is the number they want you to plug in for x? They want you to plug in 15. Okay. If I wrote the problem like this, if I were writing a textbook and I wanted you to plug 15 into this function and I wrote it as y equals 7 minus 2 thirds x, what would the instructions look like to, to tell you that that's what I want you to do? I give you this function, and then what do I do? What, what words do I tell you to get you to put 15 in for x? Substitute. Substitute what? Okay, substitute 15. What am I saying? Yeah. Substitute 15 for x. Okay. So just to be literal about it. Okay, I've done that. Substituted 15 for x, right? Is that is that what they wanted us to do? Is that it? The sum total of what they're trying to get out of us? What do they actually want? Use the whole way. So like, do the math too, right? So, so substitute 15 for x, and we could say like determine the output. Well, that's a lot of words to be really specific. Okay. Substituting does not mean evaluating. Uh, we could say uh, substitute 15 for x and then evaluate the expression. Evaluate the expression for the given value of x and I have to tell you x is equal to 15. It's a lot of words. It's a lengthy set of instructions. So instead of using y as the name of the function, now we, we, we have the, the name y right now. Can you give the name H? Okay. Now, it's only H because F is the first letter of function, so F is the most common. And then we work our way past F. F, G, H. And that's usually where it ends because we don't normally use more than three functions at once in one context. So we'll do F, G, H. And then some common ones are P, Q, R, D, N. Just kind of, you know, depending on the context, we'll use different names. But the name is not that important. It's just the name H. Okay? And then what this part says is not H times X, but H with an input of X. The function is called H, and the input is X. So when, if I were to write this function, and I were to write the, the right side over here, I should expect to see some X's over here, right? right. Maybe I won't see any X's, but I shouldn't see you know, just a bunch of R's or M's. There should be, if there's variables, there should be some x's in there, okay? There should be some x's in there if there's any variables at all. So there are x representing the, the place where we're going to put things in, where the input goes. So now I have the same kind of thing as over here. It means the same thing. This is the output. This is the input, okay? But now h of x represents uh, the output of a, of a given x. So if I want to say all this, substitute 15 for x and determine the output, instead of all that, I can just say h of 15. This says a lot. It says, in the function called h, that you know has an input of x, put 15 in for x. And implied in this is evaluate the whole thing. So instead of saying all this, I can just write the letter h, parentheses 15, and that conveys, through function notation, we all agree that we're going to use this function notation, and this, this means what I'm saying it means. Uh, we're going to put 15 in for x and see what happens. So 7 minus 2 over 3 times 15 over 1, if you like, just to make it easier to look at. 15 cancels with 3, and that's 5. So what? This is 1, so 7 minus 10, negative 3. Okay. So all that, the h's and the x's and all that kind of stuff, that's all it really means. That's all it means. Be careful that you don't do things like, if you see h of 15, it means plug 15 in for x. It does not mean 
take 7 minus 2 thirds x and put a 15 next to it and then try to figure out what to do from there. Some people will multiply and some people will just combine it with a 7. And there's no point in that. There's that, that has no use to us in this function. A function only serves to have things put into it and then have things come out of it. And you did not put 15 in there, you just put 15 next to it and then it's kind of up to you what you think that means. And it's kind of funny because you're the one who put it there uh, incorrectly. So that just means plug 15 in for x. Um, we'll use function notation almost exclusively uh, in a, at a time soon to come and from now on. Did that help? Did that clear up function notation in any way for anybody? Did not. Okay. Did it not clear it up for other bodies? Okay. Then, are there any more questions? Are there any other kind? No, then we'll pass it on. So moving on to 2.2, uh, 2.2 and 2.3 are going to be the last sections we do before we, we test on this. And here's, here's the thing. Uh, all this up till now, I would consider, and I think you would probably agree, a review of stuff we've seen several times. We did a lot of graphing of lines at least. We're going to graph other functions, but we graph lines for sure, ad nauseum in algebra, okay? So this is a review, but it's also a reminder. Um, so we're gonna have a test on that. Uh, we'll have a review day, as we will with, um, with all of our tests. We'll have a day where I pass out some review materials. You can put together, you can ask some questions, you can ask some stuff, and then the next time we'll do the test. So we'll be done with review stuff, Today, I'll give you review material and have that period to review to your heart's content in your own fashion and to have me here to ask questions. And I don't know how to test the class after that. Okay. Um, so 2.2. We're going to talk about the slope of the line and what this signifies. So you're all familiar with slope, you've heard it before, this is review. So what would you say, what kind of a thing has a slope in the first place? A, hill. a line has a slope, a hill has a slope, uh, because a hill, if you look at it from the side, has a, a line shape, right? Okay, so uh, when you drive it on a road, it tells you the slope of the road is 6% grade, or a pretty steep grade, or a 2% grade. Do you even know what that means? It has everything to do with slope. Bring that in. Anybody know what percent grade? No truck drivers here? Oh. Hear it? Not a truck driver? He does like construction stuff, but I don't know what it is. Oh, you don't know. He doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't help know. me out. All right. Well, he would maybe do like roofs or something like that. A roof, the slope of a roof. I mean, it's a building. It's okay. Don't it's worry okay. about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So let's, let's talk about grades. So you, you see a, a sign that has a picture of a truck. It's black. Right? Like this. It's like a box. This. And don't worry. That's a good picture. Okay. And it's got a little triangle here. It's filled in. And maybe it says 6% grade. Uh, it could also say slope. It could say slant. It could say steepness. It could say any number of words that mean uh, slopiness or steepness. So a 6% grade is, is just another way to express what slope is. It's a, it's a ratio of vertical change to horizontal change. Okay. What is, what is 6%? How do you normally, like how would you express 6% as a fraction? Six per hundred, or a cent, cent meaning hundred, so six per hundred, six over a hundred. Six over one hundred. It's a six over one hundred grade. Let's just call it slope, because it's the same thing. So this is uh, vertical, this is horizontal. So for every hundred, it doesn't even really matter, but let's say feet, hundred feet. Uh, so for every hundred feet that you drive, what would you say happens vertically? Six feet higher? Either, yeah, depending on, well, we're going downhill here. There, yeah. There's other ones that are going uphill. So downhill, uh, we would go six feet down, okay? So let's say that from here to there is six. So uh, we have a line tool. All right, so there we go. For every hundred feet that you drive horizontally, you're going to drop six feet. Okay. Um, that's fairly steep grade for you to, to drive on. Even worse, walk on. That's exactly what slope is. It's a measure of what happens vertically from one point to another versus what also between those two points happens horizontally. Um, what do we often call this vertical change? It starts with an R. Rise. Rise. And what do we call this? Run. Run. Rise and run. So now if you see a grade sign, now you know what it means. Life applications. How wonderful. But we want to translate this into graphs that we normally look at with x and y coordinates and points and all that kind of stuff. Okay. But keep in mind the basic definition of slope is a vertical change versus a horizontal change. What's that ratio of the vertical to the horizontal? Okay. And it's just it's just a ratio. Okay? Um, they call it 6%. We could express this ratio in lots of different ways. We could simplify it. We could do it as a 3 over 50, right? We could say this is a 3 over 50 grade. We could call it a 3 over 50 slope. Uh, that's what this road is doing. You could, um, if you were able, stand here and then measure only horizontally somewhere down the road. Um, and let's say that you measured um, 150 feet, not 100 feet, but 150 feet horizontally. Okay, so you're able to measure just that horizontally. So if you come horizontal off a slanted road, you're going to be kind of coming off the road and, and it'll be up in the air. And then when you come down to the road, how far down will you come if you've gone out? 150. Nine. Right? It's just one and a half times of 100, so there should be one and a half times of six. So wherever, we, between any two points that we measure, the ratio will be the same. It'll all, you could either simplify it down, or if you're working with decimals, you could multiply it up to uh, this guy right here. So this, we could say, has the simplest slope. It can be expressed as a 3 over 50 slope. Okay. So keep that in mind. Rise over run. Vertical change over horizontal change. See, now what we want to do is find the slope between two points, because that's how we do things in algebra. We use 
the uh, Cartesian coordinate system where we have x is your horizontal, positive on this side, negative on this side. And not only do we care about x, but these are representing functions where x can change and when x changes, y changes. So we also want another number line that goes vertically, negatives down here, positives up here. It's really just two simple number lines placed on top of each other perpendicularly so that we can compare any two pairs of numbers. Okay, pairs of positives, pairs of negatives, negative positive, positive negative, just like that. So if we had two points, let's be specific, like 1 comma 3 and this one, um, call it 7 comma 6, 7 comma 6. We still want to find the slope of this line. line between these two points, a line that goes through these two points. That means finding the vertical change, the rise, and the horizontal change, the run. So let's look at that vertical change first. So now we're, we're dealing with points. That's where we are. That's our world. How am I going to find this vertical distance right here, given the information that I have? Just tell me y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's cool. Memorization. Draw the graph out. How, how do you count? Can you count from here to there? Yeah. Absolutely. You could count from there to there. Let's do that because, well, do we know where this is? You know, where, how high this is? It's how high? I was going to tell you the slope, or the, whatever it's called, like y2 minus y1. Oh, that thing. But I said not to do that, right? Did you hear that? No. No, you didn't hear that. I said don't just tell me that, because we know that. And in the end, that's what we're going to have. But we're, now we're going to make sense of it. Right? And that's good, because right now, you guys are like not sure. And that's, that makes it clear. You're not sure where that y2, y minus y, what that even means, really. You know what numbers to put where and how to find it, but you don't know why. You don't know the significance. So we're going to count it. Carl, right? That's an idea. Uh, how high is this? That's my question again. How do we know? One, three. This is x. This is horizontal. That's how far the point is horizontally. It's one in the right direction. And this is the y value. The y value is a vertical direction, or a vertical value. It's three in the upward direction. So we're up three. We're up three. And how high is this place? Six. 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 Right? It's the vertical that just how high is that point? That point is six from the x-axis. So if this guy is six and this guy is three, if we were to count from here to there, what would we find of us? Three. Three. Now we really know that, not because we can count it, because it's not drawn out completely. We don't have the grid there. But we do know that if I came up three, it would take three more to get to six. What we've really done is just take in six minus three. We just found a difference between those two. That makes sense. If we if we are a total of six, and then we take off, we subtract that piece right there that's three, what's left. Right there, from this point to that point, will be 3. Okay. That's the vertical change, the change uh, or change in y. Okay. Now, how far is it from here to there? Six. Why? How do you know? 7 minus 1. This point is 7 away from the y-axis. Right? These are our points of reference. This is 1 away from the y-axis. And so from here to there must be 7. Take away that 1, you'll be left with 6. 7 minus 1 is 6. So 6 minus 3 is 3. And then 6, that's 1 half. 
And so the most, even though we went up three and over six between those two points, uh, we could do, we could find closer points apparently. We could just go up one and over three. We could go up four and over eight. We could go any ratio of one half. What? So, so we took six, and we subtracted three, took six and subtracted three, um, and that works. We can see that this big piece is six and this little piece is three, and well, the difference is what's between the two. What if we had a point up here at uh, five, four, and a point down here at uh, three comma negative three? Well, here we just took, uh, say, the higher one, 6 minus 3. Can we just take 4 minus negative 3? Like, give us this, this vertical distance between the two? No. Or that would be off a little bit somehow. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What's the, what's the distance between, the vertical distance between this point and that point? Just by counting it off. Between here and there? Oh, no. From here to, yeah, all the way down to this point. How far is that? Vertical. 7. How did you do that? then it does work, right? Yeah. You take a y value, even minus a negative y value. Now that negative, when you subtract the negative, turns into a positive, we're actually adding 4 plus 3. Okay. 4 minus negative 3 is 7 over 5 minus 3 is 2. So 7 halves. So now, rather than using specific values of uh, x and y, we'll generalize it. So we have a point, we can call it the first point, point one. And this point over here, we can call it point two. This point has an x and a y. This point also has an x and a y. And we know from the previous examples that we could just take this y value minus that y value and then put that over this y value or this x value minus this x value. Um, but right now that is problematic because they're both called x and they're both called y. So how do we distinguish between this x and this x? Right, that's where that x1 and that x2 comes from, okay? And y1 and y2. If this is, I see a lot of heads looking down at your, what I've been thinking is your homework, and it's fine, if, but if it's easy enough to do without me explaining it, then maybe it's easy enough to do with not too much time given to it at home, and maybe you could pick up something that you didn't pick up the first time around, okay? So I'd appreciate your attention if you don't mind giving it. So to distinguish between this x and that x, this is the x from the first point, this is the x from the second point, and likewise for y. And just like this specific example, we just took whatever this y value was minus whatever that y value was. So this y value minus that y value over the x value from the same point. That's the important thing. It does not matter which point you call 1 and which point you call 2. What does matter is that you find the differences between the second point, whatever you call the second point, and the first. If you switch them and you accidentally do this y first, minus that y, and then you do this x minus that x, you're going to be close, but you're going to be off. It's not going to be correct. Okay? The numbers are going to look similar, the signs are going to be off, it's going to have a different implication about you know, what that line looks like. Um, there we go. In general, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 will give us what we call the slope, which we represent by the letter m. So I'm just going to give you a quick practice. Can you find the slope between these two points? Number 10. Number 10, find the slope between those two points. We're going to draw a picture, or read a picture. Make sure you 
sure whatever you do is consistent and thorough and doesn't leave these room for mistakes for you. Sure, whatever you're doing with the drawing a picture or whatever that you eventually come back here and use this approach. If this doesn't stick with us, then this is the definition of the slope, then it's gonna be difficult in the future when you have to learn this anyway because it comes up again many, many times. Mike? Um, can you put like Y1 in front of Y2? My math teacher last year taught it that way. That way your brain doesn't have to like crisscross. Oh, well. Sure. First one could be Y2. But the only thing you've done there is, is what I said. It doesn't matter which one's called 1. It doesn't matter which one's called 2. So the actual value, whatever the values are, as long as these two, right above each other, come from the same point. Likewise, for these other two, they come from the same point. Right? These are from one point. This is from the other point. What you actually call them, uh, it will commonly be called Y2 minus Y1. And the reason for that, let me say you're right. I'll just say you're right. And have peace with that. And the reason why it's y2 is minus y1 is like if if I'm walking along, I'm walking away from the wall, and at one point I'm uh, I don't know, seven, eight feet from the wall now. Okay, I took that measurement at one point, and then I walked all the way over here, and let's say I was 20 feet away from the wall. Well, if I want to know how far I traveled between those two points, like after I had walked away from the wall, I would take my final, the end, or the second one, minus the first one. So that's why the two and the one are the way they are. But in the end, it doesn't matter whether you call it one or two, just as long as if you do that, these are one and these are two. So that doesn't matter. Ten, give us the points. Negative three, six, and three. We could call this point one, and this point two, or we could call this point one, and this point two. It won't matter in the end. We'll do it both ways, and we'll be absolutely sure of that. All right, so let's call this two. So this would be y2 then, y2 is three minus y1, okay, y1 would be 6, uh, over x2, that would be negative 7, minus x1, which is negative 3, minus a negative 3, that's negative 3, over negative 7 plus 3, that's negative 4, so negative divided by negative 3 fourths, positive 3 fourths. We can do it the other way, we can take 6, minus three, six minus three, that y minus that y, which just means we need to start with this x when we do the x's, negative three minus negative seven. So that's three, that's negative three plus seven, so that also is four. And it doesn't matter which way we go, um, because at least if we, if we look at the graph, uh, here's one way to look at it. Uh, we have negative 3, 6, negative 4, 2, 3, uh, 5, 6, and 
negative seven, three. If I start uh, here, okay, and I use this slope, I can go up three, vertically three, and to the right four. Well, these are both positive moves. Up three is positive in the vertical. Okay. Up and then to the right four. Okay. Two positive moves will get me from this point to that point. If I start here, I could go uh, down three, down three, and to the left four, right, two negative moves in the vertical and in the horizontal. And I still get from one point on the line to another point on the line. That's, that's all the slope communicates. Say I start at this point. So we're not now we've, we've got out of calculating slopes. We're going to talk about kinds of slopes and what the lines with those types of slopes uh, look like. Let's say we're using a positive slope. Right. So just to clarify, in case you didn't realize, the rise over run. If I'm on one point of a line and I know the slope is three four, so I can go rise of three up three and a run of four to the right four. That was a positive slope, so let's look at a generally a positive slope and see if we can uh, use inductive reasoning to say all positive slopes, something, right? Some, some uh, broad, broad brush for positive slopes altogether. Okay, so if it's positive, that's positive over positive. So if I start at this point, I'll have to go which direction for the rise? To go up, right? I'm gonna go up. So from this point, I'll go up. Uh, and now where do I have to go? Right. To the right. Okay. So I have to go up and then to the right. Uh, what would you say about any line that has a positive slope? How would you say that they're all going to have something, this, this one thing in common? Whether I go up a lot and to the right a little, whether I go up a little and to the right a lot, what would you say this line is doing? Rising down. From what? From left to right. From left to right is rising. Okay, so if it's a positive slope, gotta go up and to the right, maybe you got a point up there, it's gonna rise, it's gonna be very, very steep, it's gonna be rising from the left to the right. If you go up a little bit, it's the right a lot, okay, but still two positive moves, okay, also rising from left to right. So it rises from left. Right. Whether a little or a lot, it will rise from left to right. And also, you could say it falls, right? Just so we don't confuse that. It could fall if you go the other way, if you go from right to left. But why would we go from left to right? Why do our eyes naturally want to go from left to right? We look at stuff. We read. We read in America and a lot of cultures, we read from left to right. That's our natural disposition. Okay. But a negative, a negative could be a positive or a negative, so we'll look at that one. Uh, we'll start here. So if I were to go to another point on this line, I would go first, which way? That's positive. Up. Go up, up. And then what does that mean, negative? To the left. To the left. Up and to the left. Okay, if I have to go up and to the left, I can't avoid but have this kind of a shape from here. To there. Whether a little or a lot, we would say that it doesn't rise, it what? Falls. It falls. Okay. Whether it's uh, a lot, falls really quickly, a really steep line, or we go up a little bit and over a lot and it's not very steep. Well, what if it was the other way? We could do uh, negative over positive. We would just go down and then to the right, and we would wind up getting the same kind of a line. So it falls from left to right. Look. 
kind of a slope but a horizontal line. You can justify that with rise over run. You start here. You know how we get to the next point. Michael? Zero over one. Zero over one, or zero over anything, right? Because when we start here and we want to go to the next point by rise over run, you know, step by step. If we rise, we rise nothing. We don't go up at all. And then we can move to the right however far we want because, well, we're still at the same height. So all the points are at the same height. So up, zero, rise is zero. And rise is in the numerator, so we take zero over, it doesn't really matter. We can just say zero over the run. Well, zero divided by anything. Take nothing, cut it into five pieces. Each group has nothing in it, right? So, zero slope. How about the vertical line? And okay. if you read the answer in the book and you tell me that it's undefined, that's great, but I want to hear like some reasoning as far as rise and run. Something over zero. Something over zero. Exactly something over zero. That's, that is one of many uh, undefined things in math. If we start here, we can rise as much as we want. Because we see there, we're not going to have to move over at all. It's just everything is, every point is right above every other point. Rise over zero. But what's the thing about dividing by zero? Error. It's impossible. It's, uh, well, your calculator shows your error. It's impossible currently. It doesn't have a definition of math, so we call it undefined. Okay. What does it equal? It doesn't have a definition. It's undefined. Okay. Now this might seem odd, but uh, math is always changing. Uh, so maybe some point in the future we'll define dividing by zero and we'll figure out what that means within the construct of our math. Maybe we'll come up with a new math that works some other way and dividing by zero has a meaning. Um, and I don't say that just to be funny, though you're not, you know, probably find that amusing. But um, just like at some point, a negative times a negative, probably we didn't know what that was. What did it, there was at one point we didn't even have negative numbers. It's like a, a global uh, community, mass community. We didn't have any idea what negative numbers were. So when we tried to take a negative times a negative, we had to figure out what that was, we had to prove it. And when we divide by zero, there just is no one thing that it equals, and so we can't do it. Okay? Right. If I were to draw a parallel line to that line, what would it mean I did? when I draw this next line so it's parallel. That's just to, simple, to uh, signify that they're parallel. But what, what do parallel, parallel lines actually do or not do? Like, don't cross. It has like the same slope, it's just got a different uh, point. Okay, so they don't cross. That's like the basic definition of a, of a parallel line. If we're looking in the context of slope, it's pretty clear that they have the same slope. You gotta have the same slope. Okay? You gotta be in the same slope and, as Michael was saying, be in different places. You could have the same slope. Here's a line with one slope. And well, we'll just use this. Here's a line with one slope. And this line has, let's say, the same slope or close to it. If it actually had the same slope, let's do it this way. Just take this. Definitely has the same slope, definitely is parallel. But if we put them right on top of each other, are they parallel? They violate that never cross. They're always crossing, right? So we can see two parallel lines that will never cross clearly have the same slope. Okay? Parallel lines would need to be parallel no matter how close we move them, let's say, let's put it that way. And if the slope of this, this bottom line was at all different from the other line, at some point, whether down there 
were up here, they'd cross each other. And I have the exact same slope. Uh, they will cross. So parallel lines have equal slopes. And I use the word equal because slopes are numbers. That's, that is exactly what they are. Um, and so what you won't have, this is something I hear a lot, what you will never have, what doesn't make sense is to say you have parallel slopes. If you get it, and you know what you mean by it, I know what you mean by it, but parallel lines, lines are parallel, and slopes are equal. Lines are parallel and slopes are equal, because slopes are numbers. And lines are physical things that can never touch. Okay? Now, I'm going to draw a couple of lines here. Uh, one like that. And the other I'm going to draw, I try to draw so that it's perpendicular. And maybe you already know this about parallel or perpendicular lines, like what their slopes have to be. Um, and that's great, and you can use it and apply it and all that kind of stuff, but I want to um, verify it. I'm going to prove that the slope, that if one line is per perpendicular to another, their slopes have to you know, be related to each other in a specific way. Right. So let's get to that. So we're first going to look at this green line, and we're going to call it, give it a slope of something. We're going to uh, give its slope a name so that we can talk about it. So we'll start at this point, we'll go up, let's say we go up A, we don't want to get specific, we want to say general, then we'll move to the right, and let's say we move to the right B. All right. So what's the slope of this line? A would be rise over run. I'm going to go over to this other line. And look at the slope of it. Now I can go up as far as I want. Can we agree that? Yeah. If I go up and I go over and I divide those two numbers, the ratio will always be the same. What I'm going to do is something I think will be helpful. I'm going to go up, I'm going to stop right there because I'm going to at least um, say that that length is the same as this length. So this B is the length of this whole dotted line right here from there to there. And then we'll have to move over some amount, and that's the thing we don't know. We don't know what that is yet, and through this process of reasoning, we're going to determine it has to be something. If we go up B on the black line, and it's perpendicular to the green line, it has to be something, something specific. So first let's start out with well, if these are perpendicular, that means something specific. What does, what's this angle right here between them? 90. 90, we can write that, we use that symbol to mean 90. What's the angle between these two right here, between this A and B? 90. Also 90, and how about between here and question mark? 90. 90, also 90, okay. Now I'm gonna color in this angle, I'm gonna color it yellow. And I'll color this one All right, so we're going to use the things that we know about triangles. And that is the sum of all the angles. So the sum of all the angles of a triangle is how much? All the angles? This one's 90, and the plus the other two are going to be 180. So 180 for a whole triangle. How much is this of the 180? And so how much do these two have to add up to be? What? Well, not necessarily 45 each, but yeah. one plus the other is 90. But 45 each would be uh, a possible scenario. Okay, so let's say this yellow plus blue is how much? 90. 90, okay. And how much is this angle right here? This big one from the black to the green? 90. Okay. So yellow plus something is how much? 90. So if yellow plus something is 90 and yellow plus blue is 90, then what is this? Blue, blue. It's blue. Okay. 
And same thing here, this is 90. All three of these have to add up to 180. So blue plus something is 90. So this is what? It's yellow. Okay. So without knowing that this was equal to B, we know that all the angles are the same. What do you say about two triangles that have all the same angles? Not sides necessarily, but all of the same angles. What do you call those two triangles? Um, equilateral would be a triangle where all the angles are the same. Equiangular. Uh, that's the same thing about equiangular, equal, equilateral, that specific triangle. But I'm saying if this triangle has the same corresponding angles as this triangle, they're not identical, they're not quite congruent. They're similar, okay, which is really close to being congruent. They're similar, okay. But if we then say this side is B, this, course, this longest leg, this longest leg and this longest leg are the same, and they're similar, then now these two triangles are what? They're congruent, they're the same. So if this is B in length, and this is B in length, and these two triangles are the same, how long is this? So now we know, my question mark, a. So for this line, if we go up and over B, up and to the right, up A and to the right B. For this one, we have to go up B and what? Over A. Over which way? To the left. To the left. You've got to go to the left, A. So here, this line, M is equal to M is equal to A over B. For this one, M is equal to what? B over A? Negative. negative. Whatever A is, this is a positive number, this would have to be a negative. B over negative A, or negative B over A. So if two lines are perpendicular, one has a slope of A over B, the other one has a negative B over A. What do we call these two? The reciprocals. So, perpendicular lines have, okay, uh, the reciprocal, is that all they are? Just reciprocal. Negative reciprocal. Negative reciprocal. How about opposite reciprocal? Or negative reciprocal. Which is opposite is what they use most often. Opposite reciprocal slopes. So I'm going to ask you in some of these homework problems to see if some lines are perpendicular or parallel or neither. And if you find out that one is three fourths and the other one is four thirds. Are they parallel, perpendicular, or neither? Neither. They're neither, because they're both positive. One of them needs to be negative. Three-fourths and negative four-thirds, that would be perpendicular. And the last thing we're going to talk about in this section would be um, Let's say we have a graph. And over here, we have dollars. And here we have hours. So let's say you're at your job. Okay. You show up, you start working. We're going to plot how much money you have um, at any point during that work day right, that you have for that job on that day. Let's say after uh, two hours, two hours, you have sixteen dollars. Okay. Then at um, five hours, five hours. Let's say how much will you have? Forty. Forty. How did you figure that out? Well, because if like by sixteen by two is eight, so you get eight dollars an hour mm -hmm. times five by eight. Okay. So this is. Uh, an example of a rate of change, a rate of change that most people are familiar with, dollars an hour, we all have jobs, we're familiar with jobs and how they often pay us. Uh, so if in two hours you get $16, 
Well, all we, we kind of know at that point is that you have $16 up to two hours. But if we simplify that, we get $8 per one hour, we call a rate of change. We figure out that we have $8 for one hour. Now we know the rate for every hour. And so now if we have X amount of hours, we can just multiply that rate by that number of hours. We know how much money we've made. $40 after five hours. Well, that $8 per one hour is really just the slope, right? Uh, Michael, really quickly, just put 16 over 2, or really found the difference between 16 and 0, and then 2 and 0, and found 16 over 2 was. Not only the slope of the line, the slope of the line, but now the slope is the rate of change. The rate of change is just how fast is this dependent variable changing versus how fast is this horizontal, this independent variable changing. Now let's say we were to change these units and we'll just cross it out. Maybe we would just cross this out because this could be miles and this could be gallons. And we could say after two hours we use or, or two uh, um, after using two gallons of gas we've gone 16 miles. So what do we know about our car? It's a gas hog. It's a gas hog. <laughs> because it uses eight miles per gallon, which there are some cars out there that are trucks and SUVs maybe that do that, older ones. Okay, we could uh, change this again. It's not miles and gallons, it's inches and years. So after two years, this something has gone 16 inches. So what do we know about that something? Eight inches for every year, which is slow. Right, so we know that thing is very slow. Whatever it is, whatever, however we change the variables, that's our rate of change. That's how the vertical thing is changing versus the horizontal. Um, I won't share that in a joke because we'll try it. So slope is the rate of change. That's the big moral of the story. Okay. All right, next section, um, we're all familiar with it. We know how to use slope intercept form, I'm sure, but I want to try and illuminate something for you. So y equals mx plus b. We're all used to this. We've seen it a lot of times. It's called the slope intercept form. Why is it called the slope intercept form? Not slope, so that intercept there. Nobody knows why. I, I don't know why. I use this in algebra lots of times. So what does this represent? The slope. And what does this represent? Which y intercept? Y. The y intercept. Okay. The more you participate, the more you offer up those things without me pointing it out piece by piece, the, the better and the more significant it'll be for you. So there'll be lots and lots of long, awkward pauses. If you don't offer up an answer, I will pull it out of you eventually, but it'll take longer and it'll just be awkwarder. So we got the slope and the y-intercept. Um, the thing about this form, or any form, of the equation of a line is we're just exploiting the fact that to draw a line, what's the minimum amount of information you need? Two points. Two points. Two, between two points, you can draw a straight line, and if it's really the straight line, all of the points on the line will be on that line that you draw between any of the two points, right? So to draw, an to draw the graph of a line, 
when you give an equation, what you want to do is find two points. And you want to find two easy to find points or two difficult to find points. Easy. Too easy to find points, okay? So, yes, for an equation like y equals 2 thirds x plus 3, we could use the y intercept up 3 and use the slope up 2 and over 3 and then draw a line between those two points, which completely uh, skips over the point of, of finding those two uh, points, um, why we need those two points, what this line represents. As we talked about before, this line represents all the solutions to that equation. All the x comma y's, all of those ordered pairs that solve this equation. So we could look at it like that. And, and that is, is what we will shortcut ourselves to do. That's the fastest way to draw that line. But since we already know how to do that, let's just talk about why that is, why can we find that so quickly? So first, the y-intercept is 3. What are the coordinates of that y-intercept? 3. 0, comma, 3. Okay, now think about any y-intercept. What are the coordinates of any y-intercept? 0. 0, something. 0, y-value. 0, y-intercept. So, what we really did is smartly use the easiest number to multiply by. What's the easiest number to multiply by? Zero, followed closely by maybe one. Because when you multiply by zero, there's only one answer ever. You just multiply by zero, you get zero. So we exploited that back by plugging in zero in for x. This is zero now. And you add three to zero, you have three. Easiest math to do uh, probably this year. Just multiply by zero and add three. You can do that with any slope intercept form equation of a line. So we just plug in 0 for x, and there we get our y-intercept. So just plug it in 0 for x. Okay. So let's say we did that. Now we found a point by plugging in 0 for x, and we got out 3. That was super easy. Um, next, let's say we're going to just plug in another x value. And let's say we go to the right. Let's move to the right. Okay. Let me try and highlight what I'm about to ask you. If I put in a 1, well, that's not the greatest answer to get. 3 plus 1 times 2 thirds, so that's 2 thirds. 3 plus 2 thirds, that's 3 and 2 thirds. To graph that, it's not so great because it's in between two values. We're going to have to kind of estimate where that is. So if we want to get exact values, like put in a whole number, get out a whole number. What would be, after 0, what would be the next number you want to plug in for x? Nice and easy to work with. Clean it up. Well, again, 1. If we put 1 in there, we get 3 plus 2 thirds. That's not that bad. Is there an easier one that we can plug in? Two, two make it better? Would three be better? Three, why three? Why would three be good? Yeah, the, if we multiply two thirds by three, we cancel the three with the three, we just give it two. Two is left. So three is a great one to plug in. You just do two times one plus three, two plus three, that's five. Okay. So three comma five. Okay, so this point happens to be up two and over three from there. Okay. What would be the next x value you'd want to plug in after three? Six. Six is good because six will also cancel the denominator of this fraction. So the 6 cancels with 3, we get 2 times 2. So we know we have two groups of 2 to add to 3. So 3 plus 4, and we get up to 7. So really from this point, we move over another 3, and we just add another 2. Right? That's the pattern we go about. Up 2 and over 3, up 2 and over 3, up 2 and over 3. Okay. In standard form, We have ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are all just real numbers. Let's not pack up quite yet. Okay. <coughs> so really quickly, what we want to do, just like before, is find the two easiest points to find. Okay. So if we had 2x plus uh, 6y equals 
um, say, 4x plus 6y equals 12. All we want is two points, and that is all we want because we know a line will go through those two points. What's, let's make the math as easy as possible on ourselves. We're going to plug a number in for x, right? What's the easiest number to plug in for x and to multiply by 4? 0, right? It goes away. Multiply by 0, it goes away. So let's look at this. x, plug in 0. Well, once that's 0, that's gone. Then how do we solve for y? Divide by 6. Divide by 6, and we get y is 2. Let's use the same reasoning. It's still easy to multiply by y, and we don't have to just multiply, uh, put things in for x. We can put something in for y if we want to figure out what x would have to be. Plug in 0 for y as well. Then, all I have to do to solve for x, divide by 4. So 0, 2, 3, 0. There are our two points, the two easiest points to find. Do you have to do it this way? Do you have to plug in 0 for x and 0 for y to get this done? No. No. You could do it however you want. You could plug in any numbers you want. So why do we do it this way? It's easiest. It's the easiest because we're smart, we're clever, and we figured that out, and we want to make it easiest on ourselves. Easiest mathematically, not easiest like we just put it in our calculators. Not lazy, we're just working smart. Thanks for paying attention. You want class to go faster, have more time at the end? Participate more, it goes faster that way.